Welcome to yet another fabulous Linux Zoo Crew. We have a lot of hot topics in the news that we are going to discuss today. But before I begin, I would like to go ahead and pass the microphone to our co-host, Total OS Today. Alrighty then, we have another fabulous Zoo Crew. We are loaded this evening, so let me introduce our superb guests. We have C. Smith. We have Edward 12 Lixer 01, Oscald. I think I said that right. Who cares? Pitcast, Poppy, of course, Spatry, and your humble, quiet, goofy co host, Toss Today. Uh, I think you've had more coffee than I have, and uh, I'm actually on my fourth cup, <laughs> interestingly enough. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Welcome, one and all. And that's right, we are covering some of the latest news. I haven't done a newscast in a while, mostly because it's a lot of work doing all the chroma keying and optical compositing and all that other stuff I've done on my previous shows. I thought I would bring this up for the community to discuss. And, um, a few little things that caught my eye. Uh, one thing uh, that Quids Up spoke about last week on the Linux A team was the fact that Microsoft is in the top 20 for donating code to the Linux kernel. I'd like to read to you guys a part of this article and then we can discuss this a little bit. Such has been the joy in the Linux blogosphere over Red Hat's NYSE RHT ascendance to the billion dollar sphere that's been difficult to imagine anything that could possibly top that excitement. But guess what? A new report from the Linux Foundation recently offered news that many consider equally monumental, monumentous and potentially just as encouraging for free and open source. For the first time, Microsoft appears on the list of companies that are contributing to the Linux kernel, noted the Foundation in a press release last week announcing the latest edition of its report on the state of the Linux kernel. Now, the article goes further to say that Microsoft's contributions to the Linux kernel is to allow people to be able to run their operating system in virtualization environments and that sort of thing. And uh, why don't you start us off, Total OS, today? Well, first of all, to our listeners, let me just say that Spatry and I briefly switched like roles for the introduction, and I think I just broke one of my vocal cords, but I still love you, Spatry. <laughs> we'll skip the court martial this time. Yes, thank you. You know what? Yeah, that news item, <clears throat> that, you know what? It's, it sounds bizarre because I've been using Windows obviously before Linux for so long. And something like this, I'm really not sure what to think of it. There seems to be like a, you know, a, some kind of a technology merger, a marriage between, say, open source and non-open source, or more precisely, maybe this is an adaption of how to take technology into the future. Now, I didn't, I didn't read that, that article. I do remember seeing something like that, um, you know, sometime in the past. But I don't know, is this, cons is this really conducive in the long run to the open source world or is Microsoft up to something else? Honestly, I don't know. But it sounds like they're, they're trying to do something so, so everybody can get together or can live together in harmony with, with either operating system now. Uh, how is this going to affect users? Uh, I'm not really sure. Oscar Uh One thing I do have to really say about this, they are contributing code not for to help Linux, but to help themselves. Uh, I don't know what you guys think about it, but personally I just see, it, I mean it is good, but it is, as you've already said, just for virtualization, so it's not really that big of a topic, if I'm personally honest, because it's just for them to make more money. Yeah, I tend to have that point of view as well. I think it's for their own needs and not necessarily to help out the Linux community as a whole, because the fact of the matter is Linux is gaining in popularity, and Microsoft wants to make sure that people are still going to purchase their products products. Edward, why don't you go next? Yeah, like you were saying, um, I think that they're trying to sell the code to Linux because, like they said before, Linux can uh, they can sell the code to the Linux kernel because they must be trying to make money out of it somewhere. And if they can get a better understanding of the kernel and the code, then maybe they're trying to implement these sort of things into like Windows 8. C. Smith. 
Well, I've been following this fairly closely, and as I've read, they are actually doing cleanups of one patch they submitted. One. And these cleanups were for their Hyper-V compatibility. Look, sir. Yeah, I think this is totally for their own good in the general sense, if you take it from uh, a tech, uh, an IT point of view. Pinkcast? And what license does this fall under? I believe it's... You know, actually, I don't know. I forgot the licensing uh, licensing for it. Linux kernel itself under the GPL license, so... No, the codes are contributing. Microsoft Code essentially provides device drivers for Linux that help it detect when it is running Microsoft's proprietary Hyper-V virtualization system so that performance is improved. Oppie Chip gave me that tidbit of information. Well, I think it, it just promotes them on Linux, so it's just getting them out there on another platform. And this is also under the GPL version 2. Uh, do you have... Wait, they put the software under that license? They have to because it's the Linux uh, kernel, so they can't uh, give it something without having it under the open uh, source licensing. So, of course, they could have went with Apache 2 or their own licensing, which but GPL is the best option because that's what Linux kernel already uses. Now, Alan Pope from Canonical is with us. Do you have any impressions on this? Yeah, as others have said, it's it's really... Microsoft contributed about 20,000 lines of code back in July 2009, and most of the contributions that that amount to this, uh, keeping them in the top 20 um, contributors to the Linux kernel are cleanups to that code. So it's gone from 20,000 lines of code down to 7,000 lines of code through those cleanups. And that's and this contribution is pretty much the work of one person and it is all under the GPL v2 um, and it is totally self-serving it's it's to enable Microsoft to be able to run Linux inside their own hypervisor on their virtualization platform in the same way that we can run Windows under VirtualBox and QEMU and KVM and all the other uh, Linux based virtualization platforms. This is so that they can do it the other way around. They can run Linux on their virtualization platform and it serves nobody but Microsoft and Microsoft customers, really. Uh, yeah, I just want to back up what uh, Poppy has said as the original point that I put across as well that this is giving something to the, the kernel itself. But mainly it is just to benefit Microsoft as a whole. It has got no benefit whatsoever in reality to the kernel itself. Uh, without their code, I would be happily fine with my little uh, kernel. Well, I don't think... Well, I'm going to take this a uh, little bit of a different topic on that. The main topic. Um, Microsoft. I don't think Microsoft would have uh, donated any code at all if it wasn't for the uh, consumers demanding that they have uh, support for Hyper-V and all of that technology on Linux. Uh, originally, they wanted to keep it... I think Microsoft wanted to keep it to their own platform, but uh, customers started demanding they wanted it on Linux. Okay, now let's take a look at the flip side of this coin. We know that they're in the top 20 uh, donating code to the Linux kernel, and uh, it's apparent to all of us on the panel here that Microsoft is doing this for their own uh, self-serving needs. Now, uh, in another news topic, Microsoft buys Netscape patents and may start abusing those patents soon. Let me read to you the, uh, some of this article. AOL has signed a deal with Microsoft to sell over 800 of its patents and their related patent applications to Microsoft. The deal also grants Microsoft a non-exclusive license to its retained patent portfolio for aggregate proceeds of over a billion in cash. Following the sale, AOL will continue to hold sig a significant patent portfolio of over 300 patents and patent applications spanning core and strategic technologies including advertising, search, content generation and management, social networking, mapping, multimedia and streaming, and security among others. AOL has also received a license to the patents being sold to Microsoft. Now, we know Microsoft is using patents to attack a number of companies out there. Uh, recently, we've read in the news that they've been attacking Motorola. They're against Google because they were claiming that uh, Google and its operating system is uh, infringing on a number of their patents. And then, of course, we discussed uh, in, a in a prior episode that Linus Torvalds himself 
is attacking these bogus patents. Obviously, there was a discussion that happened years before uh, the long file names in the FAT32 file system came about. Before, you know, before Microsoft purchased the patent, they were already discussing doing this in Linux. Uh, who would like to go first? How about you, Total OS today? Well, I must say, Spatry, I'm, you, have, you may have picked the wrong co-host tonight to, to attack Windows since I love Windows 7. But that being said, I am the type of person that until I see something uh, in final writing, now I'm not an attorney, you know, of course, but uh, until I see something in final legal document or, you know, or in disclosure, a final, you know, something that is finalized, to me, yes, it's been reported in the news, but I don't like to judge either way until something has been finalized legally. So from my point of view, to me, this is part of it may be speculation. I mean, I see where you're coming from and it's understandable, but uh, you know, this thing where, you know, one company attacks another company for patent infringement and then that company attacks back, you know what, this, this is normal in the, in the, in the political technological world. This is not going away. I mean, you know, we all know, how uh, you know Steve Jobs? You know rest you know rest his soul. How he hated Google Android. But uh, you know it's look, it's part of the market. It I think in the end, in the end, consumers somehow, some way, in some unusual way, will probably benefit. You know, but for Microsoft to look out for their own self-interest, there's nothing wrong because Ubuntu is looking out for their own self-interest, just like Apple is. So I'm not saying it's right. But, you know, it, this is the world that we live in. And honestly, the way I see it, if you don't like what a company is doing, if, if you don't like an operating system, don't use it. It's, it's like watching a TV show. Like, if you don't like that channel, switch channels. And from my point of view, well, I mean, I'll, I'll pass this on to, to uh, somebody else, but that is my point of view. No, as you can see, you don't have that choice. Uh, there are, there are uh, alternatives to Windows. There's no drop-in for replacement. Some people are just going to have to use Windows regardless of how Microsoft acts. Before I pass this on, uh, I would like to read what some have said on IRC. Uh, Timmy mentioned it's not about protecting your rights to something. It's about depriving others of the rights to do things. This is something that's really going to hamper innovation. Uh, Oskolit had a point of view he wanted to share on this. One of the very big points I wanted to make was the fact that with patents, uh, with Microsoft within a heyday of uh, Windows uh, 95, which made its most money, uh, how many patents did uh, Microsoft own? Uh, they owned five patents, and these days they own numerous patents and I can personally see that the company is failing. Uh, I've been testing uh, Windows 8 for a little while now. Um, they haven't listened to anybody. Uh, Microsoft is too consumed in getting all these patents and trying to own everything when in reality that is going to be of no use to them. Users do not care about exclusivity of software. They care about does it work. Edward. Well most of us don't have time to read end user license agreements and stuff. So, like they say, really, unless there's something saying in black and white, in big massive writing saying, you can't use this piece of software because it's now legally owned by Apple or whatever, or by Microsoft, then I don't see why it really, why we should get really in depth with which patents belong to who. Uh, a few things. Uh, I don't think the changing channel analogy works in the same way that going out and buying a different car doesn't work. Um, that analogy doesn't work either because Microsoft have market dominance through dodgy business practices that they've done for many, many years, uh, locking vendors in, uh, making it extremely difficult for other software companies to um, deliver their products on um, OEM platforms by forcing the OEMs into deals that prevent other software vendors from getting into the market. Um also, the, the types of patents that Microsoft, oh, the other part of the comparison that doesn't work is com comparing Microsoft, um, patent attacks and Apple patent attacks with Ubuntu doesn't work because we don't have any patents. We don't attack anyone, neither Canonical nor Ubuntu. Um, in fact, we do go out of our way to avoid any patent nonsense, um, by, um, 
not shipping um, known patent infringing software, which is, you know, something that, that we get criticized for not shipping codecs, not shipping, you know, encoders and stuff like that. And we do that because we want to avoid this kind of nonsense and the ridiculous state that the software patent system is in. What's also interesting is the patents that Microsoft have bought from AOL, and it is a done deal. It's not a, it's not a, just a press release. Um, it's, it's, you know, well documented and, um, it, it is a done deal. Um, the patents that they've gone for are ones that in the past AOL have, um, basically said they would, they would not sue anyone over things like SSL. SSL is used by everyone every single day. Um, anytime you log on to, you know, a secure website, you're using SSL. I don't appreciate Microsoft having patents on things like as fundamental as SSL. This is just. That it gives them the the tools in their chest that they can go and attack pretty much anyone, and I and I really don't think that's a good state for the web, the open web, to be in. It is this whole control Microsoft really want, and to be honest, SSL, which is one of the really really big things in this patent, uh, you're going to perhaps own. That's crazy to think that this company, which I think will enforce it because they're just that crazy, it impacts not just. Uh, big companies but little small companies as well so the likes of uh big companies uh facebook google all these companies will start having to pay a microsoft tax as i call it which is insanity uh so i really do not want this uh transaction to go through yeah this is not anything really new that microsoft has been is doing because they have been doing this for a long time and really, it's nothing that Microsoft doesn't do usually. They've been doing this, I believe, since at least XP. All right. First of all, Alan, welcome back. It's good to hear your voice again. And just just a quick second off topic. Ubuntu 12.04 looks freaking awesome. And I've been waiting a whole month to say this to you. What's up? Anyway, that was from the last, last Linux uh, 18. But... Quick speculative question, is, self, is self-preservation is self such a bad thing? I mean, when it comes to Microsoft, I mean, right now, I personally do not feel threatened by what they are trying to do. So again, is self-preservation such a bad thing? And let me have, a, let me throw in like another speculative, speculative question. 30 years ago, Ubuntu and Microsoft switched roles. So today, the premier desktop operating system is Ubuntu and not Microsoft. Wouldn't Ubuntu be doing the same thing? Um, no, <laughs> uh, we don't have a war chest of patents to attack anyone. Um, Microsoft have a history of attacking people. Uh, Apple have a history of attacking people. And now many other companies are in on that. Nokia, Motorola, HTC, Google are having to defend themselves against these patents. We're not doing that. We're not in the business of, a, of attacking other companies. You say you don't feel um, attacked by this. They're not after you. They're after going after software companies that are using technologies that Microsoft feel that they have patents on. So they can either, A, stifle that that um, innovation and crush it. And that, that's what they would do with the competition. So they would use that to stifle Android or iOS so that their own um, operating system, for example, on phones could succeed where it hasn't in the past. And they're doing that not by innovating, not by making a better product, but by crushing the opposition because they have patents on, on technologies that are in those competing products. And the reason, um, the second part is that they attack innovation of small software companies. So a very small company that, that creates a, an innovative product can get completely crushed by uh, a lawsuit from Microsoft that they absolutely can't defend themselves against because they don't have the financial capital to, to do that. Now, that sounds reasonable. So, uh, I, I, so I guess the ultimate question is, what is a fair compromise between all parties involved? Donating patents to um, the Open Innovation Network, which is what companies like Sun did a long time ago, um, donating their patents to a pool and having an agreement between all the parties in the pool that say that we agree not to um, attack each other um, based on the patents that are in that pool. And that, that's been going on for a long time. But Mark... I can't see Microsoft spending a billion dollars for a bunch of patents and then stick them in the pool and be friendly with everyone. That's just not the way Microsoft works. So, yeah, let me say one last thing, not not to sound, you know, 
mean or nothing. So if I am a Microsoft lawyer, I, could, I mean, it could be argued, so I have no right to hold on to my patents. I'm assuming that's where the conversation is going. Just speculation, of course. So a, any, any company has no right to control or do anything with, they, with their patents, with, with their patents that they choose to? Um, it's it's not a case of d- not being allowed to do what you want to do with the the patents. The patent system is broken anyway. Being able being able to um, patent technologies as simplistic as swiping your finger across a screen or patenting the squareness of a tablet computer. These things are just fundamentally broken. Um, the U.S. patent system is is broken, and you need to start from that perspective rather than where we are. It sounds like what we need, uh, Alan, is more humanity and less politics. Yeah, the only thing that raises a question in my mind, you know, if Microsoft keeps acquiring all of these patents and keeps attacking all these companies, eventually they're going to start fighting back. And as some have mentioned on IRC, you know, and I share this view that abolishing patents is a sane solution. I'm not sure... Abolishing patents is the right way. I think um, there needs to be reform. I'm not clever enough to know what the solution is, but I, I know that the way we have it now is not the right way. I think the trick. I think the trick is to find somewhat of, of a fair solution that is equitable to all parties involved. Now, I suppose in, you know, in the end, if 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 enough Windows users like myself really got ticked off. Uh, what they're trying to do to say Ubuntu, which is another favorite OS of mine, I suppose I could refuse to buy the Microsoft, you know, I mean, like the Microsoft products or like any product and just refuse to buy it in protest and hit them where it hurts, like, I mean, like in the pocketbook. Yes? That hasn't worked in the past. You, you, you know, you go in, you go into any retail outlet, PC World in the UK, Best Buy in the US, try and find a computer other than an Apple computer that runs anything other than Windows. It, it's they, They've got the market sewn up and they've got it through their questionable business practices that made it so that it is very difficult for people to have choice. So you could say, I don't want to spend my money on Windows, but that's you know very difficult to do. As I was going to say, uh, Windows users actually knowing about things like this is a is an is next to none. Most Windows users won't even know the fact that they own patents and they're going after a open source uh, community. So that kind of works its way around to nothing, basically. But if we trace patents, we may end up back at politics and the lobbyists. Yeah, I'm sure we could go on and on and on about the patents. I mean, it is a very hot topic in the news today. But uh, let's go ahead and move on to something else at this point. Uh, Something of interest that caught my eye. uh, Canonical may be launching an Ubuntu phone OS. I saw this article on uh, the Muktiware website, and it looks like there's a recent job posting from Canonical, and they're looking to hire somebody to actually uh, bring Ubuntu to the phones. Now, we've already seen the prototype videos online, and I may have a link in the show notes as well so that you guys can see this, but there's an Android that has Ubuntu on it, but it looks like Ubuntu is, or Canonical, is going to actually uh, have a phone operating system. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Alan? In a word, no. (laughs) I'm kind of kidding. (laughs) Um, So, Mark announced um, some while back in a blog post that he wanted, by 2014, he wanted us to be on phones, tablets, um, uh, TVs, you know, and all manner of other things, you know, fridges, running machines, you know, anything and everything, so that we're, you know, embedded and baked into everything. And um, and we've been doing some research. We're, you know, evaluating the market and talking to hardware vendors and talking to OEMs and stuff like that. We we don't actually have a phone to show anyone at the moment. Um, so you can see the fact that we're recruiting a business development manager and product managers and that kind of that kind of thing means you know we're nowhere near ready to show anyone a phone. Um, we're just at the early stages of it right now. But yeah, it's interesting. Total OS today. 
Yeah, I did see that uh, press release. I think an Ubuntu phone, Alan, is terrific, but just a little bit of warning. If that Ubuntu phone has anything that resembles ATI drivers, then horse stable to the Ubuntu phone. I don't think the Ubuntu phone is going to have any uh, ATI graphics at all in it. No, no, I, I don't mean ATI graphics exactly that, but what, what, what I mean are, you know, something that might resemble a glitch, a bug, and this is after it's been tested by the developers, if you know what I mean. If Ubuntu does manage to do all this uh, by 2014, it's going to make a very, very huge platform for Linux as a whole, not just for a canonical as a subcategory, but if people start using uh, these things, they'll get more interested into it. So that's what I'm really, uh, that's what drives me to want it to happen, is the fact that it's going to make things uh it's going to publicize linux as a whole unlike and android uh is linux based but they don't really uh publicize the fact that it uses the kernel at all i don't think they even mention it in their documentation so i'm sure ubuntu would <laughs> if they make ubuntu for mobile phones will they have their own app store and will they make any money from the app store itself like android and ios have done i'd imagine so i mean we already have a, a software store um and i i you know, phones, phones and tablets and TVs. It's all about the applications. It, we we would be foolish to put out a phone or a tablet that didn't have a feature where you could add applications, you know, somehow and buy them through the phone and buy them through the tablet. It would be foolish for us to not do that. Would all the apps that are free on Ubuntu be able to be free on the Android phone itself? And you, because you're basically docking it and running it through a monitor like you would if you was running a PC. Well, that's that's something specific. Ubuntu for Android. That's a very specific um, uh, device, um, and that that has a proper desktop environment on it. Whereas a phone which doesn't do that, you know, a, a typical phone that you just keep in your pocket and you don't dock to a screen. That w I I don't think that kind of phone would be suitable for every single application that's in the. Um, the software center at the moment you know if you if you would look through you know even something simple like apps we ship by default thunderbird rhythmbox libreoffice these are things you just you you're not going to run on a phone you know there are other more suitable um cut down or mobile friendly touch friendly interfaces that you would run on a phone but i i don't think you'd see you know the standard apps on a, on a phone but the specifications on the phone, it would be able to run it, it's just being able to use it on a device. Because if you dock, if you've got the phone like the Android, like a droid, where you can dock it, you'll use your keyboard and your mouse, and say you've got a phone that's like a dual core one gigahertz processor with nearly a gig of RAM, that's well, that's well easy enough to be able to run Ubuntu on it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and, and it's possible that you might be able to port some some apps and some people, some developers who currently write apps for Linux may well touch enable their devices or make them, you know, make them have bigger buttons or make them less reliant on menus and all the other things. You know, if you, if you look at the iPhone or you look at an Android phone or you look at the iPad, there's no desktop apps on those. They're all designed specifically for those devices. Do you think that, um, Canonical and that will have enough time to be able to develop all these or do you think they'll have to get more people working for them to keep up? It's a great question. Um, we're hiring like mad. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I wish you guys a lot of success, Alan. Uh, I, I think the Ubuntu phone sounds great. The only thing with me living here in the States, I just had a thought, you know, trying to market something like that here in the States may be problematic because... Even though we all know what Ubuntu means, you know, I mean, the word Ubuntu from a purely mom and pop consumer is not a, um, I'm trying to think of a word, is, is not a sexy name. But I mean, I'm, it will probably do well better overseas before it does, you know, any kind of dent here in the market, you know, here in the markets in the States. But hey, I think it's a terrific idea to have another player, you know, on the smartphone market. So, uh, how do you think you would uh, come on to go about uh, publicizing this? Because that would be a, a really big thing. I mean, with a desktop environment, there's not much. It's word of it's word of mouth more so. But with a mobile phone, the market base is a lot wider. So you'd have to be able to advertise it more efficiently, if you know what I mean. Um, 
Well, look at how phones currently get advertised. Um, it's generally by the mobile phone manufacturer. Uh, I mean, I to this evening while I was watching TV, I saw adverts for Android phones, but they weren't made by Google. It wasn't the software vendor that made the advert. It was HTC advertising their phones. So I would think the same kind of thing would happen. We would probably partner with um, one or more hardware vendors. They would make phones that would have Ubuntu on them, and they would do the advertising. That sounds uh, pretty well what I thought you would do. I mean, that's how Android does it. So just getting a, a good a good company, good hardware man- manufacturer to do it for you that have enough money themselves to publicize it. So getting someone big that would perhaps, one of the ones that uses uh, Android already, so perhaps uh, Samsung uh, managing to somehow talk them around to using Ubuntu would be quite interesting because at least they'd have the money to get it advertised. Yeah. Um, they, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, um conversations you know happen with all of those the kind of the kind of people that you would expect you know conversations to happen with like you know the hardware vendors the networks that's the other thing the networks also do advertising you know you see in the US you see adverts for AT&T and Sprint and in the UK we see adverts for Orange and Vodafone so the networks also do their advertising it's not it's actually Google rarely do advertising for the software. It's a bit different for Apple because they do the whole platform top to bottom. We're starting to see some advertising for Ubuntu appear all over the internet as well, though. And not only that, but the thing is, you know, once an Ubuntu smartphone comes out, I imagine people are going to be telling all of their friends about their Ubuntu phones and that sort of thing. They're going to be showing their friends all these features and uh, possibly maybe even having a phone that you can dock and it doubles as a home computer. I mean, we're talking about wonderful innovations that are coming to the table here. One thing I'd really like to ask uh, Alan here is, uh, do you have anything to say on uh, the K Ubuntu being, uh, discontin- well, not discontinued, just be bought over by uh, Blue Systems? So uh, it's not supported uh, by, sponsored is what the word I was looking for, sponsored by Clonical anymore. Do you know anything much about this? I know a couple of people have been trying to find information about this. Uh, Blue Systems, not much information is available. Yeah, we um, on the Ubuntu UK podcast, we actually interviewed Jonathan Riddell, who is the guy who is leaving Canonical to go and work for Blue Systems. Um, so um, I, I would refer you to podcast.ubuntu-uk.org or just Google for Ubuntu UK podcast. We interviewed him uh, last week. Okay, thanks very much. It's just because a lot of people were trying to find information about this blue system because there's not an awful lot. Even their web page just has a couple of links on it. But what else they support? Okay, one one last thing about the Ubuntu phone, Alan. I I I have a saying, or I have a saying that I go by is is, is something like you'll never get a second chance to make a good first impression. So. The Ubuntu phone, if and when it comes out, I think number one, it, it it has to be priced competitively, and it should have, if possible, zero bugs, meaning absolutely stable. If it's not, then that's probably the end of the Ubuntu phone. Nothing has zero bugs. Nothing at all has zero bugs. I know, but what I'm saying is it has to be more, you know, as we say, more stable than horse stable. If it's the opposite, then it's then it's doomed. Yeah, I don't think Mark would let a phone go out the door that wasn't, you know, good enough. Sounds good to me. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that one. Okay, and something else that's in the news, and everybody is excited about this. Ubuntu is coming out uh, with the 1204 in uh, less than two weeks, and uh, and everybody is excited about it. There's a lot of people that are trying out the beta that are getting updates every single day to it. Uh, I really like how Unity is starting to shape up, and... Um, you know, uh, looks like a solid operating system. And uh, would you like to share share with us a little bit about that, Alan? Um, yeah. So we've just got to the end of Final Freeze. So there's um, there's just about two weeks left until release on the 26th of April, and um, this will be, I think, our fourth LTS release. So we did 606, 804, 1004, and now uh, 1204. But this one's going to be five years support. So five years you'll get um, security updates and uh, bug fixes uh, from Canonical and from the community as well. Um, and it's it's um, it's super stable. It's a lot faster than previous releases. And um, yeah, I'm, I've been using it for a couple of months now on my main machine. And uh, yeah, it's pretty good. I, I really enjoy using it. It's really good. 
Edward's been using this now. Please tell us a little bit about your uh, impressions of the new Ubuntu. Yeah, I like Beta 2 a lot better than I did on the Alpha stages because I get less errors and less bugs and stuff. And like you say, there's like lots of updates. I mean, just in the past 24 hours, there's been a few hundred updates. And when I installed Airy, um OS, which is based on 12.04, when I did a base install to now, there was 808 updates for it, which just goes to show how quickly they're trying to push out these updates to make it as stable as possible. But yeah, I haven't really any errors. I've had no kernel panics. It's been completely stable as far as, as a beta, as a beta version. I've been using Ubuntu 12.04 uh, since Alpha Alpha 1. And I am quite honestly superbly, uh, I can't, I can't compliment it enough. Even from alpha stages, I find it to be uh, extremely stable. Only a couple of issues I find with, uh, which is quite funny actually, was with Ubuntu 1. So it was a, your own app that kind of failed in it. But uh, I've been using it all the way up and I'm quite happy with it. Uh, initially, uh, Unity was, well, we'll not talk much about it, but uh, Unity 5.10 has brought, so it's so quick and snappy now. And uh, the video lens, which I think is going to get people really, really, people see that, they'll, they'll kind of want Ubuntu. It's very, very, uh, it's very, very snappy. And I just like to put across the fact that it is so, so stable. Uh, an alpha release that's stable is very uncommon, but Ubuntu managed to do it. And the boot time on my uh, laptop, I have it down to three seconds, which was insane. Wow, that's fast. Now, C. Smith has some comments he would like to share. Yes, I have been using Ubuntu since beta, t not beta 2, but alpha 2, due to some hardware issues and kernel panics. But I have to say, as others have said, it's really stable even in, it, it was even in alpha 2. And it's got some nice UI effects too. You, HUD is one people will like. Oscar it. Yeah. Uh, one thing I, I do have to say is the past few days I did notice all the, the updates and it's 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 becoming a bit tedious almost uh, made me get rid of it admittedly uh, do you have anything to say on that Alan why is are they tra I think they're trying to push it a bit too too quickly because they're doing an awful lot of updates and it's updates almost every five hours uh, Ethan has been experiencing the same do you have anything to say on that are they trying to push it too fast perhaps so you've got to think what are those updates? They're, they're most often bug fixes. So the things in the development release. So it's, um, it's not released yet. It'll be released in a couple of weeks. So we're finding a tremendous number of bugs. We're pushing a lot of users to, um, file bugs. We've also got a, a new tool, which is affectionately called Whoopsie Daisy, um, which automatically <laughs> files bugs. Yeah, it's a lovely, it's a lovely name, isn't it? Um, which files bugs automatically and, um, allows us to capture a lot of information about, you know, things that, that fail. And, um, and I, I don't, I personally don't think updates are a bad thing and you don't have to apply them every five hours. You know, you could, you could leave them for days. My mum's machine hasn't been updated for a month. Um, but, um, I, I think updates are a good thing. It, it means we're working on it. it you know, I, I'd be more concerned if there were no updates. <laughs> Whoopsie daisy, my bleep. You mean horse stable is what you mean. <laughs> Okay, I had somebody on IRC mention, uh, High6 uh, states that uh, he feels that the latest release is a little resource intensive and heats his PC more than Windows does. Are they doing anything to work on that? There's been a lot of work on the kernel to um, reduce the power usage. Um, there's been some um, patches that have been applied to the kernel that we have that have been brought back from the newer 3.3 kernel. Um, and one of our one of our kernel developers has um, has bought hardware probes um, that he's been using to very accurately determine how much power a machine uses, and they've been tweaking lots of little tiny settings in the kernel and in the desktop to 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 really narrow down exactly what it is that's causing uh, power usage uh, to be high. And I, I personally, on my my laptop, I found it to be. I get more battery usage out of 1204 than I ever have on any Linux distro ever. Um, and um, and the fan doesn't come on anywhere near as much. So if it does, then it's possibly a bug and uh, possibly should be filed as such. And we can find out what the cause of it is. Um, but 
But my my experience is this has been better than any previous release. Just talking about uh, the, the kernel there, uh, I was reading the documentation for uh, 12.04. Uh, you refer it's referred to now as the Ubuntu kernel. I don't really know if I, I can see what a Clonical's trying to do here, but I personally just believe they should call it the Linux kernel. Do you have anything to say on behalf of Clonical about that? Okay, so this was brought up by Joe Brock, uh, Brock, my, Brockheimer, I can't remember his last name, Zonka, as he's affectionately known, and uh, he wrote a blog post about this and um, caused quite a stir. And what he, what, he, what he did was read a wiki page that says the, the 3.2 Ubuntu kernel um, that ships. It was the release notes for 12.04. And a lot of people read that to mean that we're rebranding the Linux kernel as the Ubuntu kernel, and, and that's not the case. Um, we're not trying to distance ourselves from Linux. We're not trying to say that we don't ship the Linux kernel. We ship the Ubuntu kernel. We're nothing like that. Um, but the term Ubuntu kernel actually means something. It's the, the Linux kernel that we've patched. And we, we bring in patches, as I said earlier, from the newer kernel releases that, that we're not shipping yet in order to make ours, you know, the best kernel it can possibly be for our, our users. And actually, if you look, Fedora call theirs the Fedora kernel. Debian call theirs the Debian kernel. Red Hat call theirs the Red Hat kernel. So it's not like we're doing anything weird. We're doing the same thing that everybody else does. Um, and in fact, as it's just a wiki, he could have just edited the wiki and changed it. And in fact, I think it has been changed now. It says Ubuntu kernel based on the Linux kernel. So there's nothing nefarious going on there. It's a complete non-story from Joe, and it's quite disappointing that he blogged like that. Um, he could have just asked us, and we'd have told him the answer. Um, I was just going to comment before that the number one bug in um, on the launch pad is Microsoft has a majority market share, and it's it's marked as critical and in progress. I just found that quite funny. Um, a lot of people have been commenting saying, why is Canonicals like an orange, you know, for the logo? The orange is the... Uh, so I'm not quite sure I understand. The, so Canonical's logo is an aubergine colour and the Ubuntu logo is is kind of orange in colour. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, how did how did the design how did they come across the design for the logo for Ubuntu? Uh, they hired a bunch of designers and sat them in a room and made them design a new logo, basically. Okay, I'd like to bring something up because we had a discussion uh, before the show started. And this is we're gonna clear up a little bit of a myth here. Uh, when it comes to upgrading. Now, uh, now Alan stated that it's okay just to simply uh, upgrade your system if you're using the uh, the, te- the uh, 1004 or the 1104, yeah, I think it was the 1004, I'm sorry. If you're using the 1004 long time release, you can actually upgrade it to the 1204 uh, easily. Can you tell us a little bit about that, Alan? Yeah, so there's numerous upgrade paths um, for people who are on previous Ubuntu releases uh, and they you know, want to get the latest stuff in 12.04. There's numerous ways you can get there. And obviously, it depends on where you where you start from. Um, if, you, if you're starting from an LTS release, 10.04, then you can upgrade directly from 10.04 to 12.04 when it releases in at the end of April. Um, so that's one option. If you're running one of the releases in the middle, so... Uh, 1010 or 1104 uh, or 1110 in fact uh, then you can upgrade through the releases in between so you could go 1010 to 1104 and then from 1104 to you know you could you can go through serially one release to another but you can actually skip releases by going straight to 1204 if you download the cd uh, download the iso image put it on a cd or put it on a usb key boot from it and do um, an in-place upgrade and one of the options during the upgrade is to um, install 1204 but it will leave your home files intact and you don't have to have your home on a separate partition it's just one of the upgrade options lets you uh, install brand new software but leave your home directory intact and that's that feature's actually been there for about four releases but most people don't know it exists but it's quite a useful feature for you to be able to skip straight from whatever release you're currently on to 1204. My as or such as it's called, that the graphical installer they have, uh, I don't really like the fact that it has the option to 
install over a current uh, uh, install because first of all when you install it you get all the home folders but at no stage does it ask me for a password to input uh, to install over it so i just install over it and then create a new user so my original uh install all the files are took and i i kind of see it as a security a security loophole if you know what i mean personally that's how i see it yeah i agree because um, someone, someone could install it create a new user and then they've got all the files from the previous user's home folder yes and no um if you encrypt your home directory then they can't do that because if you install over the top you need the key uh that was used to decrypt the home directory so um not if you encrypt your home but even if you don't encrypt your home if you think about it you're sat at the machine all bets are off as far as security goes if you're sat at the machine you could take the thing apart and pull the hard drive out and walk away with it so i i, I don't see that as an issue okay now something i'd like to bring up and this was brought up in the pre-show conversation as well when somebody upgrades ubuntu what happens is uh, the PPAs get removed, and uh, there are some redundant packages that are uh, still lying around. Now, how can somebody get around that? Um, well, the PPAs aren't removed. All it does is uh, rename the f the files in slash etc slash app slash sources dot list dot d. Your PPAs are listed in there as dot list files, and what it does is it renames them to dot list dot save. So it keeps them there, but they're effectively disabled. Um, and there's actually a good reason for that, because we can't possibly test every possible permutation of upgrades with every possible permutation of PPAs that people use, because there's thousands of PPAs out there and all kinds of random repositories and stuff. So the only way we can guarantee that an upgrade can work is if you're not using PPAs. Um, it, it won't necessarily always remove the software that's in those PPAs from your system. It may well leave them there. Um, it kind of depends a bit on how the package was built and how its dependencies are set up and so on. But um, yeah, if you've got a bunch of PPAs, you're going to have to probably add them back in again after you upgrade. And that, that assumes that the person who runs the PPA has even made precise packages uh, for, well, 1204 packages for that PPA. Now, what about uh, somebody who's upgrading from an older, older uh, Ubuntu distribution? Playmobot, for instance, wants to upgrade from 4.10. Will they be able to upgrade that way, or are you recommending a fresh install for somebody who's using a much older release of Ubuntu? We don't support direct upgrades from old, 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 you know, distant, past, crusty, dusty old versions of Ubuntu. Um, but they could do a clean install over the top. And if they do that, all they've got to do is, in the partitioning step, just make sure they've not ticked the format their home directory. And it will just wipe out what was there, install a new version of Ubuntu, but keep all their files in the home directory. And that is an added plus, because a lot of people have their settings for all the programs that they use. They like those settings and don't want to have to muck about with uh, reconfiguring everything. So, that, yeah, that is a sound idea. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now Root wanted to ask if he upgrades Ubuntu and uh, has a package from the PPA that is a higher version than the new release of Ubuntu. Um, he's stating that uh, that his uh, newer version may not be compatible. Yep, that's one of the pitfalls of using PPAs. <laughs> could it not update the PPAs in an update? So they could update the sources.list and then change the name from, say, Natty to... Precise Pangolin on the um, PPA. I would have probably not see it because it's not listed, because it's being disabled on upgrade. It, it could, but the problem with doing that is we have no way of knowing what the quality of that PPA is. So we can't, we can't assume that the user wants to move all their PPAs over to the precise one. So for example, for a long while, there are some package, some developers who don't actually update their PPAs until after Ubuntu comes out with a new release. And so if we um, update your sources list and change all the references to Natty to Precise and then try and do the upgrade, it's going to fail a bit when it gets to that PPA because the packages haven't been done yet. So 
I don't, it's not our responsibility to look after all those PPAs. That's up to the individual developers, and it's up to users to manage their own PPAs. We we kind of want to stay away from that. I think that's actually one of the really good things that Ubuntu does. I mean, of course, they could update all the PPAs, but it takes away if it if that if they do that. Uh, most PPAs that you're putting in yourself, you want them to be your own. You don't want uh, Ubuntu to have control over them. You have them there for a reason. There's no need for them to be updated on that you update them yourself uh, so yeah I think it's actually one of the really good things about Ubuntu. Okay I have an interesting question. I had uh, Blamabot want to know if he can get a 3.2 or a 3.3 kernel on 4.10 I want to say yes you probably can Yeah if you compile it yourself <laughs> the source code is out there, go and get it We haven't heard anything from you TotalOS today Well I um I prefer a clean install, meaning meaning I transfer all my important files, you know, documents, family pictures to my external hard drive and do a clean install erase, clean install. I prefer that way I always have, and this includes Windows too. But I will say this, I did, I did do the upgrade path in my older laptop. I had um, Zubuntu 11.10, and uh, I mean, I know 12.0.0. 1204 isn't finalized, but I, I did the upgrade to 1204, realizing it's still a beta, and it's fine. So there you go. But for me personally, I prefer a clean house, if you know what I mean. Yes, as to similar what Total OS does, I do a somewhat clean install, but with a separate home partition. It does have its advantages as you're cleaning out your PPAs while you're keeping your settings, and I feel that is a way around the PPA pitfall of upgrading. Just a quick question to Popa: If you do the upgrade through the um, inst using it from the ISO, when you when you ask it just to keep your files in the home directory, will it keep all your config files and all your applications that you've downloaded on your distribution that you're upgrading? Yeah, so it basically won't touch anything under slash home. Yeah, whatever user accounts are there, however many there are, whatever's in them, it won't touch them. It just all it, what it actually does is recursively delete slash bin slash etc slash user slash var slash lib and all the other directories, but just leaves slash home alone. So um, you can't then files installs. Well. Yeah, the only thing you well anything anything that's not in home is not safe. So anything, if you've tweaked anything in slash etc, or if you've got any MySQL databases in slash var, or you've decided to crazily put stuff in slash temp, that stuff will all get blown away. So all you configure in, dot, uh, in your home directory then, basically? And yeah, your anything, anything in your home directory is safe. All right, now Hi6 wants to know, why is Ubuntu colored pink, or uh, the pinkish pur purple color? Ask a designer. <laughs> Been through this already. <laughs> I've actually been worried that if I had to go to a machine and, uh, you know, since I'm a guy, if I had loads of pink on my computer, people might have comments. But that's the beauty of it. It is highly customizable. If you don't like the pink color, you can change it to whatever color that you would want. Well, I will say we have had an invigorating conversation here. We've covered so much ground with this. And, uh, and uh, as always, it is a joy to have you on our show, Mr. Pope. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for participating in this show. Uh, and I'd like to pass the mic over, over to Total OS today, who will take us out. Spatry, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for allowing me to use my normal vocal cords to close out the show. Uh, it's it's clear, even though I had fun doing it, that there can only be one Spatry and one Toss today, a mild-mannered uh, Superman Toss today. <laughs> but uh, yes, this certainly was a unique conversation of, of a show, especially starting from, from the beginning. Uh, I, I, I kind of feel like somewhat of the oddball uh, being a dual booter. But um, anyway, thank you once again for having me on the show. Thank you to uh, all the guests, you know, C. Smith, Edward, Lixer, Oscar Lit, Pincast, of course, Alan Pope from Ubuntu, and, and of course, you, Spatry. Thank you to all of you. Uh, these are fun. Uh, let's keep doing them as long as we can. And this includes, of course, the, uh, the Linux A team. And, uh, Alan, I, I think the next, the next Linux A team should be concerning Ubuntu 1204 after it's been finalized, of course. 
thank you once again for having me on and Spatry back to you all right and also I want to point out that we're gonna have links in the show notes to uh, Edwards channel we're also gonna have Pinkcast's channel we're gonna have a link to uh, Pulpy's blog total OS today you definitely want to check out all of these channels and websites they are definitely well worth your time I'd like to thank you all for listening and for everybody participating and we will see you next Saturday night Sunday if you're in Europe same time same channel